Hello class and welcome to chapter 11 on confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for means. We are going to be um, going the next step and using more of these confidence intervals that we have been working on in the last couple chapter, chapters and um, looking more at the hypothesis tests. So when we take a sample at random from a population, we know that every proportion we get is going to be a little bit different in each sample. So if we are testing from 100 items, we might get like 15 items uh, in one sample, we might get 16 in another, we might get 14 in another. But what's interesting about these um, different proportions that we'll get in all of our samples is that a normal model does a really good job at summarizing what type of variation we can see. And so it means that we have a sampling distribution that we can model using that normal model. Now, um, if we were to take 10,000 tosses of one die, so a single um, die from a pair of dice, we would get roughly, you know, a similar percentage across all of the throws. Not exactly the same, but roughly the same. And it would be flat like this, which is a uniform distribution. So there's there's no hump, um, there's no skew, it's just, it's pretty level, okay? Now, if we were to take two dice and toss them, we would get, and we toss them 10,000 times, and we averaged the total of the dice, or the, that we got. So if we took the numbers on the two dice, added it together, divided it by two, and then, and then had an average, this is the distribution we get. It's almost a perfect um, distribution here, okay? So this is called a triangular distribution. And we are much more likely in this scenario, we can see here um, between like three and a half here and um, four and a half, the vast majority of the averages that we would get are gonna be between that range. Um, much more likely than we would be to get one or six, which would mean we got two ones and two sixes divided by two to get that average, right? So here's a histogram of the averages of 10,000 tosses for five dice. And what's interesting is you notice that this is getting rounder the more dice we add in here. Um, as the sample size gets larger, um, so we are using more dice, each sample tends to become closer um, to the population mean. So it's becoming bell-shaped and rounder and rounder. So it's getting closer and closer to a normal model. Um, and if you notice here, look at it's getting narrower and narrower. So we don't have, it's, it's a much smaller um, possibility that we would get an average of six or one here. Um, in fact, almost zero, probably, when you map it all out, okay? So, um, and then if we go one step further here and we throw 20 dice, it gets even narrower and even more concentrated here because there's just a lot fewer potential possibilities where we would get these outlying averages um, when we have that many dice, okay? So it, it, from a natural mathematical perspective, it tends to congregate in the middle even more. So the larger our sample, or the, the larger uh, the, the number of dice that we have, the more um, concentrated it will become. So, and if you think about that, like, well, what if you were to throw 100 dice, or what if you were to throw 1,000 dice? It would just get narrower and narrower and narrower and more concentrated in the middle. And that brings us to the central limit theorem. So, which tells us that the sampling distribution of any mean becomes closer to normal as the sample size grows. So it gets rounder and narrower, um, but it stays in a normal distribution. And it doesn't matter what the shape of the original population distribution was, if we had a very small um, sample, the larger the sample gets, the more it will fall into a normal pattern. Now, if the population distribution is super skewed, it may take dozens or even hundreds of observations in your sample size before the normal model works well, um, but it will eventually play out. So 
basically what the central limit is saying is the mean of a random sample has a sampling distribution whose shape can be approximated by a normal model. The larger the sample, the better the approximation is going to be. This is an offshoot of the central limit theorem, um, which mean, which way back when tells us that everything, the limit that everything can congregate to is basically the mean, essentially. So we've now got two different distributions that we're dealing with. We've got the actual distribution of our sample, which from the dice throwing, if you remember, um, it was um, it was that triangular model. And then we have the sampling distribution for our statistic, okay? And so these are different because one of them is an analysis of the statistic itself and another one is an actual analysis of the sample, okay? So we are calculate, we are now gonna run statistics on our statistics, our statistics essentially, so. Um, the central limit theorem does not talk about the distribution of data within a sample. It talks about the means of the samples and the proportions of a number of samples. So when you have a whole bunch of samples, what is the mean of that group of samples? Um, so it's almost like we're treating each sample as a data point. And so we're just taking a step back and going one level up in our um, analysis of all this data. Now, what would be more surprising to you if you had one person in your statistics class who was over six foot nine inches tall? So one person out of the whole class, let's say there's 40 people, or having the average of 100 students taking a class being over six foot nine inches tall. Which one of those would be more unusual? Well, having a whole class full of people with like outlying, large high um, heights um, would be much more unusual than having one random basketball player who's six foot nine show up and sign up in your statistics class, right? So the first one is rare enough, but having a class with a hundred people whose average height is over six foot nine inches isn't going to happen unless like literally it's a section reserved for basketball players, right? So means, a mean in a um, population is going to have a smaller standard deviation than an individual data point will, okay? Because the everything tends to congregate centrally when you're looking at a bunch of means. So um, the normal model for a sampling distribution of a mean has a standard deviation that is equal um, to the standard deviation of the population um, divided by the square root of um, the size of your sample, okay? So the we're gonna emphasize here, this is a standard deviation parameter of our sampling distribution model. So um, it is the standard deviation of the distribution of our samples when we refer to it as the standard deviation of Y bar. Um, so whereas, um, the standard deviation for our actual sample is, is referred to uh, with the symbol up here, okay? So um, when we draw a sample from a population with a mean that we refer to as mu, um, the standard deviation, um, it's sample mean Y bar. So the Y bar is the mean of that sample, has a sampling distribution with the same mean, but the standard deviation um, is different, okay? Um, and so we write that out by taking the standard deviation from um, the population divided by the square root of the of n, okay? So no matter what population that sample comes from, it's going to take a normal model as long as we have a sample size that's large enough. So you remember when we were looking at those dice and when we had a small sample with just two dice, it was much more triangular. And then suddenly when we got 20 dice, it was nicely rounded and, and very much looked like a, a normal curve. So you'll see that lovely shape developing the larger uh, your sample size gets. Okay, so we now have two really closely related distribution models that we can use and, and a lot of the information is, is gonna be really simple um, to apply to our 
sampling distribution as we move forward, okay? So when we've got categorical data, we look at sample proportions, and then when we have quantitative data, which is what we're looking at now, then we calculate the sample mean, okay? So um, we're gonna be going, you're gonna need to use judgment then based on are we looking at qualitative or categorical data versus are we looking at quantitative data? Now, um, here's an example, okay? The mean weight of boxes that are shipped by a company is 12 pounds. All right, so now we're looking at, okay, we've got a numerical data here. It's not a category, it's not a quality, it is an actual numerical measurement. Standard deviation is four pounds, okay, for those boxes. The boxes are shipped in pallets of 10 boxes. The shipper has a limit of 150 pounds for such shipments. So what's the probability that one pallet that we're shipping is gonna exceed that limit? Well, if we're asking if the probability that the total weight of a sample of 10 boxes exceeds 150 pounds, that's the same thing as asking if the probability that the average weight for each package exceeds 15 pounds, right? Because if you've got 10 boxes on there and we wanna know if the, um, if the overall pallet exceeds 150 pounds or on average. So, um, we'll assume that the 10 boxes on our pallet are a random sample from the population of boxes and that none of them have weights that are related to each other, all right? Like we're not looking at paired boxes of sets of stuff where one box is always going to have 20 pounds worth of stuff and the other box is always going to have five pounds worth of stuff and they're always shipping together. No, we're looking at independent boxes on average, okay? So the 10 boxes are surely gonna be less than 10% of the population of boxes shipped by the company, all right? They're shipping 1,000 pallets a day or something. Let's say we're talking about Amazon level of, of shipment here. So under these conditions, we can the central limit theorem is gonna tell us that our sampling distribution has a normal model with a mean of 12, and our standard deviation is going to equal then that standard deviation from the package divided by the square root of the number of packages. So 1.26 is where our standard deviation is going to come out. The chance that the shipper is going to reject a pallet is only 0 0.0087, which is less than 1%. How did we figure that out? Okay, well, we're going to take our um, uh, 15 pounds minus the, um, at, so our limit that we have minus our mean, and then we're going to divide that by that standard deviation we just calculated for 1.26 to get a z-score of 2.38. Okay, then we take that z-score and we're going to convert it to a p-value. Use Excel, a tool for this. Don't do all the math on that, okay? Just save yourself the work. Use Excel. Um, under these conditions, uh, whoops, I just did that, sorry. Okay, so standard error then. When we're estimating the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, then we'll call it a standard error, okay? So it's like this one level up that we go, we call it standard error. So anytime you're using, um, um, anytime you're using your means to calculate something or your additional standard deviation, then you're gonna move up and it's gonna be the standard error, okay? Um, so the standard error is basically same calculation only you're starting with your standard deviation as your numerator. Oh, and one note here, when we're referring to this S here, don't forget that's your sample standard deviation, not your population standard deviation. So um, when you are calculating your population standard deviation, that's the SD, and then now that we're uh, calculating our standard error, we're going to use our sample standard deviation here. I just wanted to call that out. Okay, so why does this work, all right? Our sample proportion, um, so when we're looking at categories, we've got the proportion. This, uh, when we're looking at quantitative data, we've got our sample mean. They're random quantities. We can't know exactly what our statistic is going to be because it is a random sample and we've always got sampling variation. So the basic truths about this normal model of these sampling distribution is, is that this happens because samples vary. 
And um, when you have higher probabilities of certain things happening, then things tend to conglomerate towards the center. And when you have lesser, um, uh, lesser probabilities of other samples occurring, then you get the, the tails out on the side and it just, it works its way into that normal model. Now, although we can always simulate a sampling distribution, um, the central limit theorem actually saves us the trouble for means and proportions because it just, we can just do it all mathematically um, and, and, and know that it's going to be a normal distribution. So it, it just simplifies things a lot. Okay, so when we just look at how some of these things that we've talked about combine, let's, let's look at a diagram that is going to tie this together, okay? So if we've got a population model and we're going to label the mean as mu here, okay? And it's standard deviation um, with theta here. Um, we can draw one sample with size n and show its histogram here. And then we can do a whole bunch of different potential variations along here, all right? So look at all these, the dotted lines are pointing to some of these other potential distributions. Now, if we gather the means of all of those different models that we had, right? So our mean is gonna be um, somewhere right in the middle, all right? Um, well, and we put those all together, the mean is going to have a distribution that's gonna fall into a histogram like this. Now, the, because of the central limit theorem, it tells us that we can model this with a normal model. And so the normal um, mean is going to be mu, and the standard deviation um, of your sampling distributions is going to have um, um, your standard deviation divided by the square root of n, okay? And then your deviations here, just shown on the bottom, um, up through that three, um, that magical three standard deviation spread to either side that catches 99.7. Uh, percent of all of our values going way back to our earlier chapters. Now, when we don't know what the standard deviation is, we can estimate it with the standard deviation from one real sample. So if we have one real sample, we can calculate the standard deviation in it and use that then to calculate our standard error. So the standard deviation from that sample divided by the square root of n, and that's going to give us our estimated standard deviation, okay? Um, now, once we've done that, we can go back to what we know about calculating a standard, uh, or I'm sorry, a confidence interval. When we were calculating these before, all right, for our um, proportions, we take our sample proportion, plus or minus the margin of error, and that gives us our confidence interval, right? And that margin of error was equal to um, our critical Z score times the standard error of our proportion, okay? And so with these, uh, with this math or uh, numerical data, then we can take our mean plus or minus a critical value that corresponds again with our with the size of the interval we want. So remember that critical value, that um, z score would calculate it would correspond with a particular percentage of confidence that we wanted to have. So if we take that z score um, times our standard error that we just learned how to calculate for our sample distribution, then we can calculate a confidence interval on these quantitative data. So it's basically the exact same uh, concept, only um, now we just have a new standard deviation calculation that we're using, and then we're going to use our sampling mean, okay? So I'm writing some of this stuff down so that I can show it to you here, just in a summary in one slide here in a sec. So um, our standard deviation for our sample mean is given as um, the standard deviation from our population divided by the square root of n. Our standard error then is that standard deviation divided by the square root of n, okay? So that's all we have to do is go to the next level to get that standard error. All right, so um, next we're gonna talk about t distributions, also called Gossett's t. 
So uh, William Gossett discovered that when he used the standard error, um, the shape of the curve was no longer normal. And he called the new model a student's T, which is a model that is always bell-shaped, but there are some slight detail changes uh, when your sample size changes. So the student's T model form a family of related distributions known as degrees of freedom. So some of you remember um, that we were using some T distribution um, Excel um, formulas in the last uh, chapter, only I would have you set the degrees of freedom at 9999. That's because with an infinite level of degrees of freedom, you end up with a normal curve basically. So, and, and we used that to calculate our p-value. Now we're going to be talking about um, using degrees of freedom here with these actual numbers, and we're going to talk about how a t-distribution differs from a normal distribution. It has a lot of similarities, um, but it's that degrees of freedom that factor that we add in, it, it just changes the shape slightly. So, just like a normal model, a T model is unimodal, one hump, it's symmetric, and it's bell-shaped, okay? But with only a few uh, degrees of freedom, they have a narrower peak, they tend to be pointier, and um, so look at the dashed curve, and then they have much fatter tails, all right, um, than the normal curve. So, see the normal curve is the dotted, the solid line is the T curve, it's got the fatter tails. So there's a little more room for distribution out to the tails, slightly, okay, under a T model. Um, but when you get to it, as you approach an infinite level of degrees of freedom, then the T model gets skinnier and skinnier on those sides and it looks more and more like a normal model. So it gets a little bit less pointier on top, a little wider on the top, and then skinnier on the tails. Okay, so if we take a survey of 25 randomly selected customers, we get a mean age of 31.84 years and a standard deviation of 9.84 years. What is the standard error of the mean? How would the standard error change if the sample size had been 100 instead of 25? Okay, we're gonna assume a sampling um, standard deviation of 9.84 years here for this uh, case. So um, the standard error then, we're just going to take that 9.84 standard deviation divided by the square root of 25, because we get a sample size of 25, that gives us a standard error of 1.968. How would that standard error change if the sample size had been 100 instead um, it would be 0.984, okay? So, uh, it's quite a bit smaller. Uh, so the larger your sample size gets, the, the smaller your standard error becomes. So what does that tell us, okay? Um, well, we're gonna be using our T model here where we will say, um, if you remember our z-score, so instead of using a z-score, what we're using is called a t-score. And guess what? It looks a heck of a lot like the calculation for our z-score, only instead of using a standard deviation for the denominator, we're using our standard error, okay? So um, we take our um, sample minus our mean divided by our standard error, and that gives us, um, uh, and we're using for that standard error, that standard sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, okay? And that follows what's called, a, uh, this, this calculation at the top follows what's called the student's T model with n minus one degrees of freedom. All right, now when, um, the requirements for this model are met, then we can find what's called the one sample T interval for the population mean of mu, okay? So that, which is a confidence interval. So if we take our um, observed mean plus or minus, so our sample mean plus or minus, um, the T, the critical T value for N minus one degrees of freedom, 
times the standard error of our, uh, of our sampling distribution. The critical value is going to depend on our confidence level that we specify based on our number of degrees of freedom, which in our degrees of freedom is going to be based on n minus 1. So we just get that degrees of freedom from our sample size. All right. Now, why do we use n minus 1 for our degrees of freedom? If we know what our true population mean is, that's that mu, we can find our standard deviation using our n instead of n minus 1. So if you remember that from way back when. Um, in that case, we would use um, our uh, sample mean instead of mu because we don't have our actual true population. So for any sample, our sample mean is going to be as close to the data values as possible, and our mean will be farther away. Okay, so if we use our observed number minus our sample mean squared instead of our observed number minus our population mean squared, then um, our standard deviation is going to be too small, right? Because if you remember, based on the central limit theorem, sorry, I've got a dog shoving her way through the door. Okay. Um, uh, if you remember, let's see, what was I just saying? One second, I got to get my train of thought back here. I got interrupted by the dog. Okay. Um, because our sampling distributions tend to cluster closer and closer to the mean, our standard deviations get smaller and smaller. So, um, in order to compensate for that, we use n minus 1 instead of n for the denominator to sort of counteract that um, within our calculation. OK, so um, our student's t model is going to be different for each value of degrees of freedom that we have. So as our sample size changes, our model changes also, all right? Um, typically, in a t-table, we use a pretty limited scope of which um, confidence intervals we use just because it gets really complex if you don't, right? So if you think about if you're varying this every time you have a change to your degrees of freedom and then you have limitless numbers of confidence intervals, then it gets to be a lot of combinations, not to mention that if you don't use nice round numbers, we talked about this in an earlier chapter. If you don't use nice round numbers, then people are like, well, what's, why are you cutting it off there? Why are you saying 92% of 90% or 95%? People have more trust in round numbers when you're talking about your confidence intervals. So just pick a round number and, and use it. It makes everybody's life simpler. It, it asks, it draws fewer questions. Um, and, and then you can, have numbers that you will remember when you're using these calculations over and over again so you don't constantly have to be looking things up and, and redoing your math. Okay, so it just, we use the simple values just because it, it it's more convenient, really. Okay, um, but having those, so basically what it comes down to is at some point you have to justify the cost of the additional time you're spending if you want to get super precise um, percentages for your confidence intervals and, and why, right? Um, there's a cost benefit decision there. Okay. Now, um, finding your t values. A typical t table is going to be shown. I'm going to show you some of it on the next slide. And it shows what the critical values are with various degrees of freedom for varying confidence levels. Um, because the models get closer to normal as the degrees of freedom increases, which I actually had you guys using this um, same table to figure out your critical values. Um, the final row has critical values that are the normal model and they're labeled um, under infinity here. So this was um, from the um, uh, appendix in our textbook. And um, these are the confidence interval numbers. So if you look at these numbers, you're going to realize these look sort of familiar here. And then we have one tailed probability, two tailed probability, various degrees of freedom. Now, um, if you'll remember from last chapter, I showed in Excel that you can do this calculation as well, just using the t-dist function. And um, so there's different functions you can use. I will review those again in the in-class exercises because using all of this stuff is much easier. 
um, using Excel is a lot easier than manually looking it up and you just remove a lot of sources of error. So, um, but this is how you could look it up on a table here. You find your degrees of freedom, which is equal to N minus one. So whatever your N is, subtract one. Now you notice this particular table only goes up to 90. So it doesn't give you a huge sample size to work with. If you're looking at a thousand or a hundred or whatever for your sample size, then guess what? Suddenly um, that table becomes really a pain in the butt to go through. So um, that's why we use uh, software to do the work for us. But it's important to understand how and why this works. Okay. Um, taking a survey of 25 randomly selected customers, we've got a mean age of 31.84 years in these customers. Standard deviation was 9.84 years. Let's create a 95% confidence interval and then and then say out loud what does it tell us? Okay. So um, calculating this out, all right, take your mean plus or minus the critical value that you will look up based on what um, confidence interval you want. So 95% confidence interval um, based on if we have 25, it's going to be 24 degrees of freedom that we're going to be looking up times. So that particular critical value we're going to look at times our standard error for our um, sample um, sample mean. So uh, standard deviation was 9.84. So we'll take that and divide it by the square root of our sample size of 25, multiply that out. Um, if you find yourself when you're working on the homework looking for the formula for the confidence intervals, which I know some people were looking for last week, guess what? They're out in the slides. All right. So um, how do we interpret this? We say we are 95% confident that the true mean age of all of our customers falls between 27.78 and 35.9 years. And then we would refer to that interval um, like this in parentheses with our low boundary and our high boundary. Now, what are some of the assumptions that we have to be making here, okay? Um, randomization, again, we're assuming that we have random samples and we have suitably randomized the conditions of the experiment that we're working with. We're assuming that our sample size is no more than 10% of the population. And for means, our samples generally are, um, so this condition would typically only be an issue if we have a really small population that we're working with. Now, um, students' team models will not work if your data is really, really badly skewed. So we assume that we're, going, we're drawing our data from a population that follows a normal model. Um, data being normal is idealized, so we have to look at a nearly normal condition that we can check, okay? So nearly normal, the data comes from a distribution that is unimodal and symmetric, okay? Make it into a histogram, take your data, put it in a histogram, look at it. If it looks like it's close to normal, you're good, okay? It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be pretty close. Okay, um, for very small samples under the size of 15, the data has to follow the normal model really closely because you don't have a whole bunch of iterations to use um, in your sample to get it closer to normal. If you have a bunch of outliers or a lot of skews, you cannot use these T methods, okay? They will, they will not work. Now, if you have a moderate sample size between 15 and 40, the T methods will work fine as long as you can see that it's unimodal and it looks reasonably symmetric, okay? If it's a sample size larger than 40 or 50, you can safely assume that your T model will be okay to use unless you've got like a super huge skew, okay? Um, if there are outliers, you can look at your data twice, once with and once without to see if it seems to be affecting things, okay? So this histogram has the compensation of 500 CEOs. We have a very skewed distribution here, all right? Now, um, if we look at the plot of 100 CEOs, then we get a nearly normal plot for our sample means. All right. Another example here. We've got 25 randomly selected customers where we found a mean age of 31.84 years. Standard deviation was 9.84 years. 
We've got our 95% confidence interval, um, which was 27.78 to 35.9. We already calculated that, all right? But look at what are our, check out our conditions here. Are they met, okay? Um, well, the data was gathered from a random sample, so it should be independent. The customers are fewer than 10% of our overall population of customers. Um, the histogram was unimodal. It had one hump and it looked pretty symmetric to me. Um, what do we wanna watch out for here? Um, the confidence interval you're looking at is about the mean, not an individual observation, all right? You can't calculate a confidence interval based on one observation. So don't refer to it based on one uh, observation. You always have to talk about your population and your sample, okay? Um, your uncertainty that you're expressing is about the size of the interval, not what the true mean is. The, the mean we know, um, the interval is what changes randomly, okay? That's what can vary. Make sure that you say you're 95% confident that it contains the mean, okay? So you're not 95% confident about a value, you're 90% confident about the mean. Okay, um, for testing our hypothesis what, about a particular mean, so we say we think that the mean falls either is or um, is not a particular number, we're basing that on a T distribution. So is there evidence from a sample that the mean is different from some hypothesized value? Does this sound familiar? Hopefully it does because we're saying it's basically exactly the same as what we were doing with proportions last time, only now we're using numerical data. Okay, so um, what we do is we form a hypothesis and we form an alternate hypothesis and we run through the same process that we did in the last chapter, only we're using our T intervals here and our standard errors, okay? So we've got, a, uh, we're looking at 20 purchases from yesterday's sales at a convenience store. If the mean was $45.26 and the standard deviation was $20.67, is there evidence that the overall mean purchase amount is at least $40? Okay, so the mean is 45, 26, standard deviation is 2067. So we have to first come up with a hypothesis, figure out what our conditions are, um, and if they're met, find our T statistic so that it's that kind of similar to that critical value, figure out our P value, and then and then make an assessment, okay? So our hypothesis is that our mean is equal to $40. And our alternative hypothesis is that the mean is greater than $40, all right? So we wanna know is the mean purchase amount above $40. So um, were the purchases selected randomly? We assume so, so, and 20 purchases has to be less than 10% of all of our possible purchases unless we're running like a lemonade stand in front of our house, right? So because the sample size is 20, a histogram should be relatively unimodal and symmetric, okay? It's above 15, so we just have that basic um, assessment we need to make. Hopefully it's not skewed, all right? If there was a bunch of skew, then we would need to maybe do some additional thinking here. So first we're gonna find our T statistic now that we know that those requirements have met. All right, we're taking our, our sample mean, 45.26, minus um, what we think our hypothesized mean is of $40. Divide that by our um, standard deviation, or I'm sorry, our standard error. So our sample standard deviation of 20.67 divided by the square root of 20, which was our sample size, okay? gives us a value of 1.138 for our T statistic. So we're actually calculating this, not looking up a critical value in this case. That's, so that's a key difference here, all right? Um, what is the p-value for this test? Well, we're gonna use our um, Excel um, formula to look this up, all right? The p-value for that particular um, T that we looked up is 0.1346. So what can we conclude? Well, we're gonna fail to reject our null hypothesis. 
um, because there's insufficient evidence that the mean sales are greater than $40. All right, so we had we had kind of a large p-value there. All right, so that means there's a high probability that um, that our null hypothesis is correct. So we have insufficient evidence to reject. Now, we know that a larger sample is almost always going to give us better results just because um, each additional result or sample that we take is going to be have less individual influence on the overall spread of our results. And so therefore, we just get a larger pool of evidence that's going to be more representative. All right. But more data is more expensive to collect. So we know how to find our margin error of, of error for our mean. We know how to find the standard error for the mean. So we can determine our sample size by solving this equation for n. All right, like what, what size sample do we need? Now, um, our equation is going to have a bunch of stuff in it that we don't know. We know our standard deviation for our sample, but we won't know it until we collect our data. And we want to calculate what sample size we need before we collect our data. So then we can just kind of take a good guess at our standard deviation. All right. If we have no idea what our standard deviation is, we could run a little tiny pilot study to get a feel for what the size should be. Otherwise, we can just take a guess based on our personal experience with a similar set of data. Now, without knowing n, our sample size, we don't know what our degrees of freedom is either. So we can't find our critical value. But what can we do? Well, we can say, okay, if we were to look up a corresponding z value from a normal model and use that, um, we could use that instead. Okay. So if you've chosen a 95% confidence interval, then just grab the 1.96 equivalent z value and use that instead. So we can use that as an approximation. And then suddenly we eliminate a whole bunch of variables that we needed to worry about. So what we can use for a formula to estimate our sample size when we're working with our means is our z-score or critical value from um, the approximate confidence interval size that we want or level of confidence we want times an estimate of our standard deviation divided by our margin of error. And then take that and square it. And that will give us an approximation of what sample size we would need to have. Now, your sample size calculations are never going to be exact. The margin of error that you find after collecting the data is not going to match the one that you used to back into what sample size you wanted to have. So it's kind of a good idea before you collect your data to know whether your sample size is large enough to give you a good chance of telling you information. All right. So going back to, you know, that below 15, um, you know, or larger than 15 consideration, all right? So you want to try to have an idea and remember like 10 failures, 10 successes. Um, some of those numbers you want to, if you're, if you're going below 10 or 15, you're going to have a much lower potential for getting the type of data that you want. Whereas if you can get higher than that, your chances are going to get better, all right? So let's say we've got a survey of 25 randomly selected customers. Again, mean age of 31.84 years, same data we used earlier, standard deviation of 9.84, 95% confidence interval, we already calculated it, margin of error was 4.06. How large of a sample would be needed to cut the margin of error down to two? Okay, well, um, we can say if we had a 95% confidence interval, uh, critical z-score for that would be 1.96. Take that times our standard deviation that we're using um, based on our earlier sample of 9.84 and divide it by the margin error of 2 that we want to get. Take that and square it and that's going to give us 92.99. Got to round up to the next higher number of customers because you can't have a partial number of people and if you round down then you're too low. So rounding up to 93 customers would give us a target for our sample so that we could get our margin of error down to two years. Okay. Mm -hmm.
All right, and that is the chapter. So um, don't confuse proportions and means here. So don't use the wrong formula. Don't use the proportion formulas with a mean. Don't use a mean formula with a proportion. Make, uh, you can use normal models for proportions. Use the T model with your means, okay? Um, watch out if you have two modes, so two humps in your data. If it's not unimodal, try to break your data into two groups and then run your analyses on each group separately. Watch out for skewed data. If it's skewed, try to re-express it maybe in like a logarithm. Um, or some type of other mode that will give you a better distribution, okay? Um, watch out for outliers, watch out for bias in your measurements, make sure your data is independent, and um, that should get you where you need to go as far as these quantitative um, confidence intervals go.